a table, you'd have to have its own table, and it would it take three keys from yes. car period and user? So I'm, I'm gonna ignore. Speaking of which, I'm gonna you know because our lecture time is limited, I'm gonna ignore the the conversion of this to relational schemas, which I would release as part of the solution. You can go over it yourself, but it's pretty standard, right? For example, give, uh, with respect to you question. How do you convert reserve? That's just a ternary relation set. You, it's a many-to-many -many ternary relation set that goes to a table by itself by taking the keys from all three participating entity sets together with attribute of its own. That being said, it's going to be mean number, PID, uh, user ID, and date. For phase two, if we want to change our DR diagram, should we change it? Yeah, so that's why I'm going over the solution today, and I will release this after the lecture this afternoon. Uh, basically, for your phase two, don't wait for the TA to grade your phase one, and then only make correction to your phase one and start working on phase two, because take time for TAs to finish the grading. By the way, they, they are almost to the end of uh, grading of your homework one. But that being said, you should not wait until you get your phase one graded to start your phase two. You should start your phase two right away using you know, the discussion today. You know, if you deny it's similar or the same to what I have, fantastic. If you deny it differ dramatically from this, most likely it's not gonna work. If you're not sure, you can check with me all the TAs, okay? But most likely it's not going to work, and it's highly recommended you amend your design to something like this, using this as a reference. Does that make sense? Okay, the only thing I haven't talked about is feedback and weight and uh, ratings. So the, spec the specification also asks you to document the fact that the fact that a user may give feedback on a particular Uber car, and subsequently it also says that other users should be able to rate that feedback given by another user on a given Uber car. Right? So if you do not have that second requirement, which is other users may be able to rate the feedback given by another user on a Uber car, it's perfectly okay to model feedback as a relationship set. Right? You have Uber user. Of a car. Then you just say, I, you know, I give feedback on the Uber car. <clears throat> right? It's probably okay to have a design like this. And it's a many to many mapping between the two, why a Uber user can give feedback on many cars. A car may have multiple feedback from different users. So it's many to many mapping. So far, so good. But if you continue with this design, and you reach the part of the specification asks you to support, you know, Uber user may rate, they give a rating, If you want to support the fact that I can rate, I can give a rating to other right? You have a problem because you cannot introduce a relationship set between an entity set and another relationship set. You follow this? So there are two ways of addressing this issue. One is you use this concept called aggregation. You introduce this as an aggregation. And basically you're saying, OK, I'm going to rate the, the, the overall interaction between user and car and the fact that this user has given a feedback on this, on this car. Think about the example from our lecture slides. I have department sponsor projects. Then later on, I want to introduce an auditor who want to oversee how the money is spent from a particular department or a particular project. That's where we introduce the concept of aggregation, right? That's one way of doing it. However, you know, this design will be, uh, looks like complicated. So a 
better approach is to say, okay, I'm going to model. Okay, I actually don't have to draw this because it's available on my graph here. So I'm going to model feedback as an entity set. So the user gives feedback, and that's a one command mapping, because each feedback must be given by a user. However, a user can give multiple feedbacks. And feedback, of course, has a total population constraint because each feedback exists because some, some user has given that feedback. But a user doesn't have to give any feedback to exist. Question over there? Okay, you cannot have more than one relationship instance connecting the two entities of the same type of relationship set. But you can, of course, have multiple different relationship sets for the two same entity sets. In, in this case, it's in this case you have gauge feedback, and you can also have rate feedback. Okay. So this is, so think about from our slides, employee, works in a department, but you can also, obviously, you can also have manage a department, right? In fact, they can have different type of constraints, but employee can manage multiple departments, meaning that a person can be manager of multiple department, but each department has only one manager. But a person can work for multiple department, a department can have multiple employees working for that department. So we never said you cannot have more than one relationship set connecting the two same entity sets. What we said is for the same relationship set, you cannot have two relationship instances of that relationship set connecting the two same entities. These are two different things. Okay? For example, with regard to this design, An employee works for a department. Okay? An employee manage that department. That's okay because these are two different types of relationships. But it's not okay to say an employee works for the same department again over a different period. That's not okay. But this and this, this combination is okay because it's from two different relationship sets. Okay, that's what we said. So, a user gave feedback, then user later on can read others' feedback. So that's the design over there, okay? That's pretty much about it, I think. Uh, uh, last part is this card type thing. This is optional, right? You can either model this as an entity set if you don't want to duplicate the information on make model, right? For example, Toyota Highlander or uh, Ford, uh, whatever model Ford has made, you don't want to duplicate that information on the car entity set. Right? Because many cars can be of same make and model. So if you model make and model as attributes of the Uber car entity set, you may end up duplicating those values a lot. So a small optimization over there is to treat that as an entity set itself rather than attributes to the Uber car. But this is really optional design. Right? Either way, it's totally fine. OK? Any question on this? On the design of your phase one? No? Go ahead. Yes? I'm still just a, a tag to the reserve. To the reserve, OK. Summarize how exactly the ternary work. Ternary works. Uh, so it's really, if you think about the instance graph, the entity instance graph, what's really going on is that uh, what I'm saying is I have a Uber user, set of Uber users, then I have set of Uber cars, I have set of periods. Right? A reserve essentially is connecting three dots together. 
So this mover user reserved this mover car on this particular period. And with the data information to it, but still, as what we said earlier in my response to his question, this still doesn't allow you to reserve the same car over the same period on different dates because you cannot connect that. You cannot do this anymore, right? Because that's already one specific relation instance connecting the same three entities. You cannot do that more than once. Then I guess. The reason I show reserve using ternary release set and write using two binary release set is precisely to prepare to, re to address like, his question, what's the difference between these two? That's why I use one, one for one for the write, I use two binary release set. For the reserve, I use ternary to illustrate and highlight the difference between the two designs. Does that make sense? If, you know, that being said, either approach is fine because the spec didn't really ask you to explicitly support write or reserve on the same period, on the same car, over multiple different dates. Things for either approach is fine. But in reality, if you want to enable the fact that a Uber user can write or reserve the same Uber car on different dates over the same period using this particular approach, then you have to use two binary relation set rather than a ternary relation set. What's over there? And when converting it to a table, would it be then wrong to say that the combination of the VIN, PID, um, login, and the date make them as a key? Would well, that be yes, I see what you're saying. You're thinking, okay, okay, I go, my ER is like this, but in order to support the fact that I want to enable the same user to preserve the same car over the same period on different dates, when I convert this, I make date as a, a a key as well. Yes, you can do that, but, but that no longer corresponds to this ER. That will correspond to a ER with Uber user, Uber car, period, and what? And the date. So it becomes a four-way relationship set. If you claim you want to convert this to login, a uh, win number, period ID, and date. You want to use the combination of them as a key, then you are really representing a ER like this rather than a ER like that. Yes, you can do this, but then, you know, in a certain way, you are changing your ER design. That make sense? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So if you go with this design, then you, it's not possible for you to have this. If you go with this design, what happens is, this. Let's say I have attribute. This cannot be part of your primary key. Does that make sense? Thank you. In other words, from ER to relation model and backwards, there is a one to one mapping between the two. One ER goes to one relation model, and a particular relation model can be reversed back to a particular ER design. There is no ambiguity or no multiple choice in that process, in that conversion process, one way or another. Does that make sense? Fantastic. I think you guys, you know, you guys are ready to do your phase two. Of course, uh, subject to the covering of today's lecture, when I finish talking about SQL as well as, I will give you a, a detailed explanation of that code. I demonstrate to you two lectures back, right? The Java code, which I will release that later today as a skeleton. Then you can use that skeleton, build and expand that code uh, to support different functionalities. Okay? Questions? Fantastic. Okay. Right. Let's go with our lecture. So where we start? We we talk about. Okay, we'll talk about this. Okay, I promise you to revisit this complex example. Find the name of sitter who reserved the most number of votes for each rating group. This is similar to say, find the athlete from each country who has won the most number of Olympic gold medals. Right? That's essentially the same type of queries. How do we do this type of query in SQL? Well, it involves multiple levels of nesting. 
So the idea is in the outermost loop, in, you know, you can view nested queries as a nested for loop, right? That's, that's essentially one way to understand how a nested query works. And each level of nesting introduces another level of for loop. Right? For i equal to 1 to n, for j equal to 1 to n, then for l equal to 1 to whatever, right? So essentially think about this as something similar to the following for loops. So you can do something like you, you, in any program language environment, like C++ or Java or Python, you can do something like this, right? For, let's say for y, then you do something, for example, the array, three-dimensional array, you do some function uh, over this, And your code here is a function of some array of x, y, z. You follow this? Yeah? Okay. The nested query is basically the same thing as here. The first level is to say for each sitter and reserve, I join them together so that I make sure I I link a sailor record with his or her reservation record because the join is on sailor ID. And after that join operation, I, in the course product, okay, after eliminating those records that do not match, meaning sailor ID do not match each other, the remaining ones from the course product is what? Is all the sailor information as well as his or her reservation record attached to his or her sailor information. Then I do a group by over that using sitter ID and sitter name. I already explained last lecture, group by sitter ID is the same as group by sitter name and sitter ID, because sitter ID is the key. So essentially you're saying, okay, I'm gonna, for, the, for that cross product, showing sitter information and key that for reservation record, I'm gonna partition them to different groups where each group represents all reservation records for that sitter. For that particular sitter, together with his or her information, such as name and age and rating. Does that make sense? That's what I got in level one. Then I count over the bold ID in each group. Essentially, I'm counting the number of reservations that sitter has made. Then I'm saying this must be equal to the max. Here, I'm using this query as the next thing so that this is supplied as a relation to the front clause of this select front block. So this is one block, this is another block, and that second block returns as a, inst as a relation instance that, that is supplied as the input to that first select front block. Okay? Does that make sense? So essentially you can think of this as I'm doing select max C from a relation T. That T had a had a had a column called C. I'm running off of color, I'm running off of in. Uh, from this T, T had a column C. And this T is then defined using another select from where block. Right, that's essentially what's going on. Now, what's that T? Well, that T is the same thing as the outermost block. I join sitter with reserve game with, uh, over sitter ID. However, with one additional constraint that I only care about those sitter with rating equal to the, the sitter rating from the current sitters, from the outermost block that, that having count. The having, if you think about this whole thing is part of your having clause, right? Having clause is evaluated at group level. Meaning for each group, you do this. And what is each group? Each group is a particular sailor. So for each sailor, you check 
whether the internal block has written equal to that sailor's weight. You limit yourself to only those sailors, you go by those sailor's sailor ID. That what I tell you. That tells you the number of reservations made by each sailor who has the same sailor rating as the current sailor from the outermost block. Then the select max is to say I want to find the maximum reservation number of reservations made by such sailors. If the current sailor's reservation equal to this max, you must be the sailor who has reserved the most number of votes on this particular rating book. Henceforth, you need to be returned. Otherwise, I should ignore you. Okay, so that's the logic of this query. You can rewrite this query. You can simplify this a little bit using set operators. So instead of introduce another select from block, what you would say is the following. You say, okay, everything stayed the same, except that I want to say having count greater equal than all of the reservation made by sellers with the same rating values. So that will simplify your query by eliminating one level of nesting with the same effect. So that's a you know, very useful construction by leveraging the property of set operations. Okay? By the way, this query looks complicated, but it's essentially the same as you know, a very simple query we have seen, right? This query is essentially the same as this. Find the student, find the oldest student record. What we have seen is exactly like this, and I can rewrite this query as At this, the only difference is in this case it's simpler to write because the age information is available from your input table. Whereas the number of reservations made by a particular sailor is not available from the base table. That's why you need to use another Google to construct it. And I can change this query slightly to be exactly the same as this, meaning that okay, I'm not interested to find the oldest student. I want to find the oldest student, let's say from Utah of the same state as the author student, as the student from author group. So what you do is, you know, you add a condition, right, where student of state is going to be in Utah, right? So that will, will that work, by the way? Will this give you the student, the oldest student from Utah? Will this query give you the student you are saying, okay, sir? Huh? If he's from Utah. If he's from Utah, exactly. So the outer block, you also need to add a condition that state equal to Utah. Not only you need to add this condition to the inner block, you need to add this condition to the outer block as well. All right, so insertion, I think we talked about this, so I'm going to skip this. Deletion update as fairly straightforward, so I'm going to delete, uh, I'm going to uh, ignore. Uh, this discussion because we talked about this before already. Now, now what is? So, in SQL, in, in relational databases, now what is a special uh, uh, attribute, okay? Special type of attribute. So, now value occurs under two conditions, right? One is you are inserting a new record, but you are not specifying values for every single attribute of that record. This happens, for example, when a student just newly is newly admitted to the University of Utah, he or she doesn't have a GPA value yet, but our student table has a GPA field. What should be the value for that GPA, GPA column for this newly admitted student? If you don't specify anything for it, 
By default, they will assign a null value to the GPA field of that student. Okay? A null value may also occur when you delete, for example, with the foreign key constraint, right? Go back to the foreign key discussion. If you delete a student record from the student table, but from the enroll table, you want to keep all those records showing that student has take whatever class got, whatever grade, you want to keep those records around. But you don't want to run into this downwind pointer problem, meaning that if you were to use a student ID to go back and reference a student record from the student table, you will fail because that student record has already been deleted. So in that case, if you want to keep those records around, those enrolled records around, for example, for analytical purposes, I want to know the average grade for a course. I don't care who has, what specific student has taken that course, but I do want to know the average, the median, the distribution of grades of that course. So even if a student has left the university, the enrolled records should be kept around. But I no longer care about the specific student ID value, right? So in those cases, you delete the student record and you set the SID to be null value in the enroll table. That make sense? So those are the two cases where a null value may occur, but null value introduce troubles to you. For example, what do I what do you mean by GPA greater than 3.0? For example, I want to find all students who has a GPA higher than 3.0. If you come to that student record, the newly admitted student record just, I was just talking about with GPA value to null. What do you mean by, how do you check? How do you check this? Now, it is true or false. This is not well defined. This is not well defined, right? So, so to handle this, most database engines introduce something called three value logic. There's true and fourth, then there's unknown. So in this case, I will simply return unknown. Be why not know? Because the behavior of the underlying database engine depends on the, the particular implementation of that database engine. In other words, it depends on that one particular engineer who writes that one line of code decides to go one way or another on this. So the behavior of the engine is unpredictable. I mean, in the sense that you have to look at the manual of that engine to figure out what they decide to do for things like this. That make sense? Whereas, if, if I'm checking 4.0, greater than 3.0, no matter your Microsoft, Oracle, or Google, it has to be true. Universally, that's true, right? Whereas in this case, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they can, if each of them design their own database engine, they can choose to do different things. Question? Can you, can you specify the query how you want to handle it yourself? You cannot. Okay. It's, it's, a feature embedded into the engine, unless you can change the kernel code, which you can do in my grad level data class. Okay, for now we're using data as a black box, right? For example, what you're asking essentially is, I want to change the behavior of my car. When I make the left turn signal, I want the right light to be on. Don't ask me why, I just want to do that. Right? It's kind of cool, right? <laughs> so if you want to do that, you have to hack into your car, right? You cannot do this without hacking into your car. Right? So that's an example of that. Or even better, if I turn my left signal on, I don't know which gonna be on. <laughs> that's his signal was playing on here. Maybe sometimes the left right left turn light will be on, sometimes the right light turn light will be on. You know, I don't want to drive a car like that, but who knows, maybe you want to drive a car like that. It's kind of cool. Alright, Jones. So join, you know, actually we, we know how to do join in SQL, right? Essentially any select from clause with more than one relation in the from clause naturally give you a join. Right? Especially today. So specifically, any construction like this, right, some attributes,
with a where condition. A, a query like this is actually the same as with a selection of that condition and the production over those attributes from the uh, select box. And when I when I limit this to when I limit this to two relations, when I limit this to two relations, what do I got? I got a special case which is essentially like this. Right? So far so good? Follow me? And this part, if you think about it, is nothing else, but this is the same as a condition drawn between the two without condition. Huh? Without. my earlier statement, which is any select from where block with more than one relation in the from clause essentially is doing a join over those tables. That means that you may wonder, okay, if we already have join supported in SQL, why we need to introduce the particular operator called joins? And there are a couple of reasons. Reason number one is join is sometimes very important. It's, it's basically a very important operator in, in database. And you want to make sure it's very intuitive for end users what you're doing. So having an explicit join operator from a, you know, a, it's basically more intuitive. Right? Make your query more easier to understand, to comprehend. But it serves more a bigger purpose than just you know, making your query more intuitive, which I will talk about later on. So join operators in SQL can be used in uh, the following form. This is to be read as a regular expression uh, uh, formula. As I said before, square bracket. Square bracket in regular expression means optional. A vertical bar means alternative choice. Select one of the following. So with this regular expression, what you can do is you can do an inner join. You can do a left, right, full, outer join. So this basically gives you four different choices. An inner join. A left or right or full outer drawn. Let's start with inner drawn first. So this is a simple inner drawn example. By the way, the default is inner drawn, meaning that if you simply write sailors drawn with reserve, that indicates an inner drawn. So the default with the drawn operator itself, with the drawn keyword itself, implies an inner drawn. Okay, so what this does is I want to basically join between CID and reserve with the condition CID equals CID. So this query is exactly as the following, which is that query is exactly the same as so I'm gonna ignore the select because it's going to be the same from, from that. From Sailors S with the R where okay, that query in the slide is exactly the same as this query here. Okay? Does that make sense? And you can also, there's a special form of inner join that's natural join. Natural join and inner join, the difference of them is that for natural join, you enforce equality condition automatically on all common attributes. And finally, in the production, if you, of course, in this case, I explicitly supply a production list. But in the general case where I supply a heuristic, meaning I put that everything out, in that case, every pair of common attributes, only one copy is projected out for natural join. But for inner join, both copies of the common attribute will be projected out. But if you do supply a projection list, then there's no difference because you're telling 
the system explicitly what you are projecting on. The inner drawing and the next drawing in that case then become you know, exactly the same. Of course, with the, with the assumption that you inner join the qualification list, which is whatever after the, the on keyword, is enforcing equality condition on all common attributes. Of course, a inner join doesn't have to do that. A inner join can use any qualification list. For example, we can say seal ID not equal to reserve seal ID. I can supply any condition I want. But for natural join, you don't have that choice. Okay, so that's the simple difference between the two. This is a simple illustration of this. Now let's look at outer join. So outer join becomes useful in the following scenarios. Okay, for example, imagine you work for Delta or United, you're a gate agent at a particular gate. Okay, and airlines always overbook their flights. Right? Like the famous incident or infamous incident from last year. I don't know if you follow the news. You know, happened more than once, right? Person made a reservation for the plane and dragged out of the plane. Because why? Because they overbooked the plane. Okay? So let's say I'm a gate agent. I want to know all the customers for my flight, the detailed information, the first name, last name, blah, 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 as well as the seat assignment for each customer. I want to produce a full manifest of such information. Okay, when there's no overbooking, that's simple. That's just an inner join between customer and the reservation table. Who reserve what? You join them together, you're done. Does that make sense? But for an inner join like that, you're going to ignore the output, will ignore those customers who do not have a SATA assignment yet. However, they book, they, book a, they book the flight, it's just that they don't have a SATA assignment. Inner join will ignore those customers because I will not find custom ID and SATA ID pair for those customers on my SATA assignment table. Does that make sense? If you do a natural join between the two, those customers will be ignored. You cannot find those customers. What if, as a gate agent, I want to know all the customers, whether or not he or she has a SATA assignment or not? If they do, I show the SATA information. If they don't, I show the customer information. Do you follow that? I want to produce that manifest. And that's called an auto join. Similar, you know, think about Sailor as your customer reserve as the Sailor second table I just talked about. So if I do a live auto join between Sailor and reserve on um, Sailor ID equal to Sailor ID, what happens? Using this as an instance, I will produce all the Sailor's information as well as the boat they have reserved and those Sailor's who has made no reservation whatsoever. I still got to produce them in my output, but my boat ID, which I'm required to put that or something for, will be a nobody. And this is called left auto join, meaning that the table from the left side of your join operator, every record from that table must be included in the output. That's why it's called left auto join. Okay? Similarly, you can do a right auto join. You can say, okay, I want to show for all the reservation, I want to produce all the reservation records. A list of all the reservation records. List of boats. Okay, I want to show the list of boats from my club whether or not they have a reservation on them or not. This is like my uh, gate agent that I have an underbooking flight. My flight is not full. But I want to show the list of all the seats and the associate assigned customer on that seat, whether that seat has been assigned a customer or not. Do you follow this question over there? Um, if there's not a value for that field, does it just fill a null or? It's a null value. Okay, so in this case, you do a out, right out the job between reserve and boats. You got this. Of course, left out the job and right out the job are symmetric. A right out the job between reserve and boats is the same as a left out the job between boats and reserve. So technically, you only need one of them. However, there are cases where 
you need both left and right autogen. For example, sailors left autogen with reserve, then right autogen with both. What does it give you? Sailor left autogen with reserve, then right autogen with both. Show me all the sailors, whether or, whether he or she has a reservation or not, together with the boat information on that reservation, whether the boat has a reservation or not. So this is a complete manifesto of everything in your sailors club. So in that case, you need left and autonomy. Okay. Finally, I can also have a full autonomy one. So if you think of left autonomy one, left autonomy one basically says, I'm going to take the inner join. Inner join is those records match the join condition. I'm going to take the inner join results and expand that with records from the table on the left. Right auto drawn says, I'm going to take the inner drawn results and expand that with records from the table on the right hand side. A full auto drawn says, OK, I'm going to take the inner drawn as my base and expand that with records on both ends. <coughs> That's full auto drawn. Okay? So, for example, reserve full auto drawn with both. By the way, in this case, the results are going to be the same as right auto drawn. Why? Because every reservation record match with every single boat ID. So you, actually you have nothing to add to your inner join from the left hand side. But imagine if you have a reservation record, say 95, CLID 95, reserve boat 105 on a particular date. Then you will expand this full auto draw result with 95, 105, and boat name equal to 9. In order, how can I have a, something like that? That goes back to whether you enforce referential integrity constraint or not. Maybe you didn't enforce referential integrity constraint. So there was a boat, model 5, caught a fire, boat is gone. Right? But even worse, boat sinks to the bottom of the, of the lake when somebody was on the boat. Even worse. Right? Doesn't matter. As the owner of the club, you say, okay, even if that boat has been destroyed, I still want to keep the reservation record on that boat floating around. Right? Okay, so that's the difference between right on the ground and full on the ground. All right. Uh, is there anything else? Okay. Next, I'm going to talk about views. Uh, let me see. I want to prioritize. Okay, let's go with this. The view is a special object in database where it simplifies, for one thing, it simplifies your query writing. Let's imagine a simple example as follows. Let's say every morning you work for a single club, right? The, the owner of the club asks you to report the number of reservations on right color boats. Every morning, or, or, as a matter of fact, every hour he or she asks you this question. So what you have to do is you will type this query all the time. You will say select both ID, count from both and reserve, both ID equal both ID, color equal right, group by both ID. But now you guys should be very good at writing this word, right? Find the number of the reservation on each right color boat. It's just a select count group by group. Okay? But imagine you have to type this every hour. Or every few minutes, your boss is obsessed with the number of reservations on right color boat. So every few minutes later, he or she come back, oh, tell me this, tell me this, tell me this. You keep typing this. So, so in, in those scenarios, you, you will say, OK, let me create some kind of representation for this so that instead of typing this query from scratch all the time, I will create an abstraction for that. Then I will query that abstraction every time. So that's kind of the concept of view. So I will say create a view called rat as this. Then I can simply type my query that select. In this case, I will simply type select star or select heuristic from rest. That's the same as saying when you type something after that view has been defined, for you to type something called select from rest. This is the same as you replace it at the wrong time. What David's engine will do is replace the definition of that and make it a nested 
Group log. Substitute the definition of class here. So that become essentially a nested query doing the wrong time. Doing the wrong time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. So an illustration. So I can query a view over uh, using our instance. So my rest using our instance is just this. Because I only have one right color vote, and there's only uh, I have I have two right color votes, but I only have a reservation on the oh not this instance. Anyway, imagine I have my reserve table, which I didn't show here, has only one reservation record on both 102 and no reservation on 104. So my rest will be looked like this. Actually, there's only one reservation on that red boat 102. Then I simply, if I select red from, then I can do something like this. I can use REST in the construction of my query. Okay. So there are also, you know, uh, functionality in SQL that enable you to do sorting. For example, you can order by. The way you understand order by is if you have your select from where grouping, having all that stuff, right? And in the final. Result, but but regardless of what you do, the finally you get a result set, an instance, relation instance as you output with multiple columns, and the sorting is applied at the last step before you show the output, in the sense that you sort this instance with respect to those columns. You sort with respect to the first column first. Whenever you have a tie on the first column, you break the tie using the second column. If you have a tie on both first and second column. Then the order of that of those records are arbitrary; it's undefined. <coughs> okay, and with sorting, you can also use a keyword called limit, which is essentially the top k. You, know, you sort them based on, you know. Uh, so in this case, what I'm doing, I'm using the right color vote. I'm 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 finding the sitters. The number of reservations for each sitter on red color vote. The number of red color vote reservations a sitter has made. And I do this for all the sitters. And I want to sort this output, meaning the list of sitters, by the number of red color vote reservations he or she has made. However, I want to limit to just top 10 sitters. Imagine if I have 100 sitters and they reserve you know, different number of times of red color vote. I want to sort them based on that reservation count, then I'm only interested in the top 10. So I'm going to use the keyword limit 10 together with all the value. Let me guess. All right, fantastic. We're almost down to the end. So instead of continuing, uh, you know, we have two more things I'd like to talk about in SQL. One is access control. You know, why, for example, you account uh, our Davis server can only do with only access, can only execute CLS statement, can only do anything else on that class by database. But then why you have another account that has full control on your own per data database? By the way, for the per data uh, for the per data database for phase two, please contact the, the the TAs to get your username and password to access your own database, right? So the earlier account and password I gave out to you is to access a class by database, which, by the way, will be used in your homework three. And I will release homework three today, this afternoon. Homework three is basically asking you to write multiple SQL queries against a database server, uh, get the results back. And you need to submit both your SQL statement as well as the results set. Okay? So I'm going to talk about this access control next lecture as well as constraint checking. Right? How do how do we do constraint checking? For example, a rise or a reservation must be made over a period on that car when the owner of that car is available. How do you check those kind of constraints? Uh, I will talk about that on um, Monday. Monday is the holiday, is that right? So we're skipping too many lectures. So too bad. I mean, that's very unfortunate. Uh, but but we're losing. Uh, one lecture due to 
what was the holiday? It was King Holiday. Then what's the holiday on Monday? Skyler, we need a holiday for that. Okay. Why? Why we need a holiday for that? Okay, so it's Monday. Okay, anyway, we do the holiday for that. Um, I mean, President Day, right? Not not every president is great. So why we need a holiday? For that? <laughs> Seriously, I don't like a lot of them. Why I need to celebrate? Them? I'm forced to celebrate. <laughs> All right. Okay. So anyway, uh, so Monday we're losing one lecture, unfortunately. So I see you on next Wednesday. But before I let you go, I'm gonna use the remaining ten minutes to go over the code that I will be distrib distributing out this afternoon, so that you can use this this week, right? From this Wednesday to it's a, it's a big chunk of time, right? Monday we do not have lecture. You can use this time to work on your homework three, as well as getting started on your phase two. There's a lot of things to do, so you better uh, you know, get you know uh, get to it right? as quickly as you can. So I'm going to talk about that code. Yes. Go ahead. Just where are the due dates for the homework three? Uh, for homework three? Yeah. The due date for homework three. I'm thinking about maybe two weeks from now, two and two and a half weeks. The due date for phase two is about a month off, um, uh, right before. I think I made the due date. This is I, I can negotiate the due date for phase two with you. There are two options. One is we make it due right before spring break, or in the middle of spring break, or right after spring break. So those are the three options. Think about it and let me know what you, you prefer. Essentially, whether you want to work over spring break. My answer is yes, you want to spring break. By the way, the break it's not to be interviewed at the holiday break. It's a break for you to catch up with what you do in your school. <laughs> Seriously, swim break is not a holiday break. Let me tell you that. Okay? For example, it's definitely not a break for me. I have to grade 140 midterms. Right? So it's not a break for me. It's not a holiday break for me. It, it is a break for me so that I can do that grading of your midterms. All right, so let's, let's look at the code. So last time I demonstrated how to run this code, So let me explain this command line. By the way, you do not have to do this using a command line interface. Uh, later on, on Canvas, I will show you step-by-step -step instruction how to do this in the IDE. For example, uh, using uh, IDE like JBuilder or Eclipse. Right? In, uh, I will show the instruction for Eclipse. Right? Uh, but the basic idea is the same. Right? Essentially, you are invoking Java, right? That's a runtime environment. That command, rapidly, you are invoking that runtime environment called Java. Dash CP stands for class pass, meaning that what are the additional packages or classes you want to link to your code to support the execution of your code. And the Java in a Unix-like environment. The class path consists of you know, the, the path to your package. Dot, a single dot in Unix represents current directory. So I'm linking my SQL jar from the current directory together with another dot, which is to say I'm using also the current directory as part of my class path so that it can load your code. And links out with a jar file, nice part of jar. A jar file is nothing else but a compression of multiple classes. Essentially, it's a compression of multiple classes. And why we, we need a nice part of jar? Let me explain <coughs> a little bit. The way you connect to a database is through a protocol called ODBC, Open Database Connection. Why is it called Open Database Connection? Because we have 
multiple different database products. We have Oracle, we have SQL Server, we have MySQL, we have PostgreSQL. Each of the database vendors can come up with their own protocol of connecting to that database. That's option number one. But if we were to do that, it will be really hard for developers to write their database code because I have to check if the database is this, I do this, else I do that, else I do that. And if I have 10 different database vendors put out on the market, you code become really complicated to write. And also you need to learn all these different protocols. So these database vendors, this, they, they solve this challenge and they manage to sit together over a table, they negotiate to something called ODDC. Meaning that they expose, no matter what your database, how your database is implemented, you're going to expose the same set of API, in other words, a protocol, to the end users, to developers, to talk to your database. And then you're going to translate. So I expose the same interface to, to the developers. On this side, that protocol, how that protocol talks to your own database engine, that's your problem, you to, to figure out. That's within your black box. But you expose the same set of interface to the outside. Does that make sense? So that's called ODBC. MySQL.jar is the MySQL implementation of ODBC for the MySQL database server. Of course, it's, it's a little bit more complex than that. You not only need to worry about different database vendors, different database products, you also need to worry about different programming environments. What if my developer client side is PHP? What if my developer client side is Java, C++, Python, Ruby, whatever, Scala, right? So a database vendor needs to come up with the ODBC implementation for different runtime environments. MySQL.jar is the MySQL server's implementation for ODBC for Java. And in that case, in that case, we call that JDBC, Java implementation of ODBC, in short, JDBC. Okay? So that's essentially what the JAR file provides for you. Okay? With that being said, you execute this code, and you get something like this. I can enter my, either enter a query by myself, I got the result. I can also enter a course name, for example, something like math, comment pass. Oh, well, there's no course like that. So let me see, garbage collection, okay. I can enter a garbage. So what I'm saying, I'm finding a course with the garbage in it from the College of Engineering. It's not a garbage cost, it's, it's talking about garbage collection, which is actually is really important and hard. It's not a garbage cost. Garbage collection is really hard, okay? So you, you, this simple program allows you to, con to demonstrate two things. One is write a query on your own, whatever query you want to write, or construct a query using user input. The option one is actually what you need for your project, right? Because if you go with option two, your project is down, by the way. You assume your end user is somebody like me. You say, okay, you have all these functions, I show you the ER and the schema. No matter how many functions you want, I give you an interface, enter your query, that's it. You're done. By the way, that's not a lot with this too. Okay. Does it make sense? Hope you got my joke. <laughs> right? So what really you need to do for phase two is expand the option one, meaning that you and user know nothing about your schema, know nothing about database. Henceforth, you ask a bunch of parameters so that you can construct your course dynamically. Right? So essentially, you, 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 your job reduced to expand that function one. So let's look at what the, what the code looks like. So basically, first of all, you you have a menu. Oh, this color is not. Let me try using another program to open this. Okay, uh, better. So first of all, you have a static method that does nothing else but just display a menu. Display a menu. 
Okay? Then there's a main function. In the main function, you do a, a while loop. Before you do the while loop, you open a new connection. That's another, that's implementing another class, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. By the way, I'm gonna overrun today lecture for five minutes, uh, if you can. So I'm gonna do a while loop to display that menu and open the connection. Then I read the, the input from user, what choice he or she has selected. Choice equal to one, I do something, choice two, equal, I do something. Let's focus on that choice one. For choice one, I ask for a course name and a department name. I take that from the input and store that into two string values. Then I construct an object called course, new course. Then I call a method from that. By the way, you should all try to do something like this. Instead of implementing your detailed function here in one class, but that one class becomes too big. Take a modular approach. Everything related with course, you implement in the course class rather than implementing your main function. Does that make sense? So let's look at, so really what we need to understand is that connector class and that course class. What do they do? Let's look at the connector class first. All you're doing in the connect, connector class is to supply your username and password, a URL for the database engine, and then you use the MySQL JDBC driver I talked about, which is from the jar file, to open a connection to your database. That's it. To open a connection to the database. And once you open a connection to the database, you can create a statement object. A statement object attached to a connection object is to, for you to execute or ask your statement and get results from the database. Okay? So this, this is this code. There's another connector class called connector2. What this connector class does is to do the connection using SSH, which I explained earlier. If you are on your home network, you cannot make a direct connection to the database server using that connector class because that connector class is direct connection. You have two options. One is to use VPN so that you can still use that direct connection class or use this class by establishing a connection through SSH first. Okay. Now, lastly, let's look at the course class. So, the constructor is nothing. I, I, this, this class does nothing for its construction. Now for the get course method, what happens? I construct essentially an SQL statement like this. So let's start from course, this is a string. And in Java, I can concatenate a string variable to a string constant using the operator class. I'm, concat I'm concatenating a string variable with a string constant. So that, well, at the end of the day, what do I get for the SQL string variable? Well, the value of that variable depends on the course name and department name, the two parameters you supply. Okay? And then I just get the statement object from that connection class, then I execute the SQL. Once you execute the SQL, you get something called result set. A result set is nothing else but a set of records return from the database server. And result set is object capture that. Then you use result set dot next, which is to keep a cursor or iterator over that set of records. To move through every record from that result set. You do some simple parsing to format the output properly, you're done. Okay, that's a bit of a crash course on database uh, coding, right? But go back and review this code. I will post some detailed instruction on Canvas, including how to execute this code and write how to run it in the IDE, such as YouTube. Okay, see you on Wednesday.